The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Morningstar IM, ABN 5407180850101, AFSL 228986, and for Dante Partners Limited, ABN 9400283592, AFSL 234668, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. How are you now and welcome to the Ensemble Investment Podcast. My name is James Whelan, Managing Director of Barclay PS Capital's Wealth Management Team and I'm here to represent you, the humble advisor, doing their best to walk the line between client interests and asset class selection. We're trying to find the things that are not only appropriate, but that are actually working to be in the right things at the right time, the right weight for the right clients. So get set because myself and Morningstar are going to do our absolute best to answer some of the questions that have come up on the Ensemble platform. All information contained is general in nature. So here we go. Morningstar Investment Management Australia is delighted to be sponsoring Ensemble's investment podcast series designed to equip advisors to have more meaningful conversations with clients. Morningstar Investment Management is a global leader in asset allocation, investment research and portfolio construction. Specialising in investing, behavioural coaching and practice optimization. Morningstar strives to give advisors the tools to confidently navigate their clients' complex needs. Morningstar, empowering investor success. Fidonte is a global investment management business which forms long-term alliances with best-in-class investment managers to provide investors access across equity, fixed income and alternative assets. We are one of Australia's largest active investors, offering compelling investment opportunities by partnering with leading investment teams globally. Our investment managers are chosen for their robust investment processes, deep experience in navigating market cycles, and their commitment to achieving the best possible outcome for investors. How are you now and welcome to the Ensemble Investment Podcast brought to you by Morningstar. My name is James Whelan, Managing Director, Barclay Pierce Capital's Wealth Management Team, and I am here to represent you, the humble advisor, doing their best to walk the line between client interests and asset class selection. We're trying to find the things that are not only appropriate, but also that work, and maybe try and find the right time to be the right weight for the right clients. So get set because myself and Morningstar are going to do our best to answer some of those questions that may have come up on the Ensemble platform, and obviously all information contained is general in nature. So here we go. Alts, alternatives, they found a way off the margins, off the sidelines, and into portfolios and into our hearts. Investing in, investing in, how do I come up with this? Investing in private companies has been something that used to be a, hey, mate, can you swing me a few grand? I've got an idea. It's going to work, to this pre-revenue unicorn in the making is taking second round funding at a $50 million valuation. All they have is a deck and a term sheet. We're in for $300,000. What we're going to do is try and find somewhere in the middle of those two things. Um, And there is some beautiful spaces in the middle of those two things. We're going to define what a private market alt is, uh, what parts are visible, what parts are opaque, what parts should be more visible, what parts should be potentially more opaque, how investors and advisors can remedy that We'll even go into a few case studies if we get the time, which we will, because I know that we've got the time because I'm running the podcast. Couldn't ask for two better heads on this one than Vesna Poroska, Portfolio Manager at Morningstar, and Sinead Rafferty, Senior Investment Specialist at Fidante Partners. Vesna, Sinead, how are you now? Very well. Thanks for having us, Jimmy. How was the intro? It was Uh, (laughs) opaque. Now, now the... Um, we're going to start with that. Funnily enough, now I'll get into the opaque side of things later, but let's start with the uh, the question that everyone gets asked here, um, just so that people, in the theatre of the mind that people have, for anyone who's just listening to this, um, Vesna is sitting to my left and uh, Sinead to her left, my right on that side, just so that people can imagine. So I'm going to start with Vesna over here. What do you do and how do you make money? Okay. Um, I'm a PM at Morningstar. I look after multi-asset portfolios on the institutional client side of the business. What that means is they're not Morningstar funds. So multi-asset um, ad- funds for advisors and super funds. And we we invest in a lot of unlisted assets. Okay. And that includes ALTS, obviously. And so that's that, which, which does include ALTS. So we can exactly. get into that question in just a second. Sinead, same question. So I lead the investment specialist function at Fidante. An investment specialist can mean different things to different places. So what it means for us is... We kind of sit between the investment teams 
and the sales teams and various other different functions. And and the role is really to represent various different fund managers in market and make sure that the right messages and the education is coming through. So it involves a lot of podcasts, a lot of videos, a lot of uh, written pieces. Um, so education is very close to my heart. No, excellent. And, and this is going to work quite well. So I'll, I'll, I'll fly into it. I was recently at a conference that was specifically on defensives. Now, it wasn't even specifically on alts, but the number of things that came up in that space um, it was a full. It was a full day symposium, and the number of things that did come up in that space regarding uh, alts and alternates was took up about maybe seventy percent of the day. So listed listed things in the defensive space aren't the, aren't the usual space that went in. The word of the day that was uttered more than anything else was opaque, and that was a, that was a real interesting. So first off, before we go into that sort of area, now this is great because we've got educators that are here, portfolio managers that are here, so we're going to be able to make some of these things that people think are potentially not as visible. It turns out that they actually are. You just have to look in the right place. I'm going to, I'm going to stop telling your story for you because <laughs> I think that we're going to get right into that. So let's let's see how we go. Um, now, first off, let's set the scene. What are we talking about here specifically to this? Because Oldnitz is, is such a, a big broad church. Who wants it? Sinead or Vesna? I, I can start hit, framing hit it and then Sinead can um, zone in. Uh, alternatives is a very broad, broad group of assets. You can primarily group them into three buckets, and there is crossover. And the first bucket is the return diversifiers, which is where I see private private assets or private markets sitting. And then there's what we'd call the uncorrelated or low cor- correlated assets. And then there's the negatively correlated or the tail hedges. And private markets do have a very important role in portfolio construction, but it's slightly different to some of the other areas in the alternative space. Um, Sinead, sorry. What I would add is, um, look, from a textbook perspective, an alternative is basically anything that's outside of traditional assets. So it's anything that isn't stocks, bonds, or cash. What does that actually mean in practice? Well, it means everything inclusive of growth and defensive, to your point. So it includes things like private equity, private credit, hedge funds, uh, infrastructure, property, and a whole host of other different types of assets. So I guess the key message here is that it is a huge market and it is only growing. And I think what we are really starting to see, um, to Vesna's point, is that there's different roles that alternatives can play in portfolios. And often people can be attracted by higher returns. And, and that is the perception that what you are getting when you invest in alternative assets, and it is often the case, and historically several of those have delivered really strong long-term outperformance relative to to the public equivalent. But the most important reason why people want to consider alternative assets is because it is a risk diversifier, it is an additional building block in portfolios, and it can add resilience into portfolios. That is very true in Every single sense of the word that's there, it is. And and we'll go a little bit more into the valuation and the market to mark to market or not mark to market side of things towards the end of uh, what we're talking about today. Specifically to this podcast, though, we're talking about private markets. So specifically, what sort of things are we are we discussing here on this one? Because we don't have eight hours. Kieran, do we have eight hours on this podcast to be able to get through this? He's shaking his head. I said we don't. So we've we, we've got to sort of try and get through this as quick as we can. We've got half an hour, thirty five minutes. I suppose we can we can get into it. So private markets specifically, what is that? So private markets is anything that is not publicly traded. So if there's a lot of overlap between the word alternative and the word private markets, but I would say that the two main asset classes that you would be familiar with is is private credit and private equity. But as I said, it, it also includes um, real assets and um uh, various other kind of m- maybe more niche strategies as well. So um, I guess what's what's super interesting about private markets is that it is very much front of mind in recent kind of maybe in the last kind of three to five years, it seems to be what everybody is talking about. But what's important to remember is that these types of asset classes have been around for about 40 years. Now, it is certainly true that the range of strategies available to investors has increased, but it has been formerly the, the purview of purely institutional investors. And what we've seen in recent times is um, what many call the democratization of alternatives. And therefore, you know, it is now an asset class, huge asset class across a broad range of growth and defensives. 
that it can now be available to not only family offices, high net worths, but also mum and dad investors as well. So there's a, a change there that's driven by new product structures. But I would argue that the most important reason why we're talking about this today is because of the new uh, macro environment that we're in. Would you like to ex- extend anything on that, anyone? About the about the new macro environment that we're in and the democratization <laughs> the of this particular asset class? The new environment is the old macro environment back again. Inflation's back up to normal levels. Interest rates are somewhat at normal levels. It's uh, what those of us that are over a certain age would remember. And that's a hurdle for a lot of the traditional parts of your portfolio because the a traditional balanced portfolio, the main drivers are equity and fixed income or duration, interest rates and, and equity. And that's very closely linked to what's happening in the macro environment. And it, it's also a very one directional linear link to a, to a great extent. So when you have a higher inflationary environment, you have access or you should actually try and have access to more assets in your um, in your portfolio to help you through at times like that. For example, real assets. Yeah. To bring it to life, in 2022, US interest rates rose from zero to five and a half percent in a very short space of time. And for the first time in 40 years, the 60-40 portfolio just didn't work. The S&P 500 had a negative 18% return. The US Ag Bond Index had a negative 13% return which meant that the 60-40 portfolio, which had delivered for decades, 60% equities, 40% bonds, actually delivered a negative 16% return. Since then, the high correlation between stocks and bonds has persisted and therefore the need to look for additional sources of either negative or low correlating assets to traditional assets is important. Go, go, going through it now, we did say that we we're going to look for some examples out there and then, and then maybe chase a few case studies about information where people can get things. What's an example that we'd, that, that we'd be looking at here? Uh, private credit. Let's talk about credit. Everyone private talks credit, about credit is a very popular asset class and there's been a lot of headlines lately. As with all of the other private market assets, um, there's quite a broad spectrum. Some of it's packaged. It, it's the same as listed or very similar to listed markets, but packaged differently. So you don't get the um, valuations on a regular basis. So you've got a lower month-to-month volatility than than equities, and that's where you're getting some of your perceived or some of your portfolio um, diversification coming in, so your total portfolio return is lower. But um, with private credit, a lot of managers actually get external valuations on a monthly basis. Mm. Private credit's uh, quite popular at the moment because it's providing very high spreads over cash. So it's a very short, what we call short duration. So it's priced over cash. And very. Um, if you're sticking to the safer part of the private credit market, so uh, asset-backed securitization or direct corporate lending, as an example, you don't tend to see over, over the history that we have in Australia and a much longer history in the US, you don't tend to see a lot of defaults or drawdowns. So it's tended to perform better than high yield and at the moment spreads are really attractive. And because they're spreads over cash, you also get some inbuilt inflation protection there. Go on. Which no, no, that's, which that's is, why we're here. Yeah. Yeah, the inflation protection is important when when yields um, or when interest rates are going up. Uh, you're you're actually going to ha- it helps you achieve um, it helps you have a, access to another tool in your portfolio to help achieve either your income um requirements or your um, CPI plus objectives over the long term. Yeah. So it, it's just one part of a portfolio, but it's it's obviously credit and there's still some risk around it. And the um, the strategy employed and the manager is very important in that respect. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. And to Vesna's point, most of the assets are floating rate. And so, you know, when you consider where cash rates are at a credit margin, at a little liquidity margin on top of that, low double digit returns for the type of risks that you're taking on is perceived in the market at the moment to be incredibly attractive. Mm. Um, but I guess there's a lot of, um, you know, the, the converse side of that is there's a lot of um, managers coming to market that maybe don't have the kinds of track record and expertise 
in this space? Have they lived through a credit cycle? Do they have the scale and size of a team that is required to actually analyze these loans? Because, you know, when you think about private versus public, the difference, an additional difference is that they're not going to be rated. And so therefore it's incumbent on the investment team to actually do the analysis and make sure that um, you know they they're getting sufficient reward for the risk that they're taking on. And to Vesta's point, like s- some of those loans will actually lead to, in the worst case, default. But but even before you get to that point, there will be stress among certain um, businesses, and, and you know, and and that is going to be the case no matter where we are in the investment cycle. And so, therefore, the ability to manage that sort of situation uh, and um, have a a risk team in place who can work and negotiate um, with other lenders in that t- type of situation is really, really important. Okay, so let's go through our checklist that I've got here. So um, we mentioned external valuations, so at least a couple of external valuations. We've mentioned size, scale of the manager. Have they been through a cycle? Four, are they rated? Good little checklist that we're building here for people to go into. What about being able to see, and we're going we're to get into this opaque sort of situation, what about being able to see what's under the hood, what's actually in the in the I don't want to say the product, but in, in the, the investment. The actual that they loans have. Yeah. and the covenants. Um, yeah. That's probably not accessible to, to um, you know, mum and dad investors, institutional investors or ratings organisations. They will have access to what's called a data room so they'll be able to see the, um, the, the contracts. The, yeah, I guess what Sinead said around um, finding a manager that's managed through a cycle or two is really important because that's one thing you can use to assess how well they may be able to um, manage any macro downturns. So a lot of managers will look at their their capital that they're deploying and they'll have a top-down macro overlay where they'll consider whether it's the time to be in consumer discretionary areas or retail and they may actually move and deploy capital as they're as they're earning, you know, they're they're getting more more um, inflows, or if they're getting their loans paid out. They'll deploy to other areas that are a little bit more secure, and they'll avoid areas like pay- maybe property construction and and retail. But there's another part of it that Sinead um, touched on, and that is from origination all cool. the way through to management of that loan. You um you need a manager who has the team and the skills to actually write to to correctly assess the risk, to be able to negotiate terms so that there's a very low LVR and that they've got solid assets. So it's um, often a loan written against a specific asset, not just an income stream. That helps protect if there is a not just a technical default, but an actual default where you need to go in and take over the assets. But it's also around them um, and and all the managers I've seen will regularly receive reporting from the companies they've lent to. So they'll monitor very closely how things are tracking. And this may seem like cheating a little bit, but because a lot of these loans will be one, one to one or two to one, so there's one business borrowing from one or two borrowers or rather a small number of borrowers, it's easier for them to renegotiate. Mm. So they can come in and say, okay, we'll, we'll alter the terms. We'll lend you some extra money. This doesn't happen often, but it just helps in um, the investor getting their full full repayment at the end of the term uh, or at the term. So you don't necessarily get it as soon as you'd expect it. And this is an infrequent um, aspect of of investing in this in this area, but it's also one of the benefits because you're so tightly. If you think about it back to the 80s and 70s, I'm not that old, but if you went and um, borrowed from your local bank, you actually sat down and borrowed from the bank manager. Yeah. Uh, That's kind of a little bit more like if you want to think of a similarity, that's what it's like. You're actually, the borrower is talking to the lender and they have a direct relationship. Yep. And those relationships are really important. It's another thing that you want to be thinking about when you're choosing a private credit manager, do they have the right relationships? Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of investor money going into this asset class and you want to make sure that that money is being deployed appropriately. 
And so access to deal flow, access to the types of um, borrowers that are credit worthy and are, is obviously going to be incredibly important. I have noticed that in credit too over my years of, of investing that there's some, some things that are just not offered at all. And, and the relationship is just, it's, it's sort of just literally on one person that has that, that network and they will just always get those deals. It's, yep. it's really. And, and relationships are really important across private markets just to kind of bring it kind of more broadly. Yeah. Um, like whether you're looking at private equity, whether you're looking at venture capital, whether you're looking at all the different types of asset classes that are available, you know, those relationships are really, really important. Often companies, um, who are looking to either raise equity or borrow money, they're coming back to the same people again and again when they're looking for either a refinance or they might have M&A activity that they're looking to do. And so that kind of familiarity is really appealing because it means that if, if they know you really well, if they have seen your financial statements for years, if they have seen your cash flows, if they are very comfortable with you as a business, then they can actually turn around a transaction in a much shorter space of time than a bank could. So that speed of execution is really appealing to a company who needs financing. Okay, that's good. Okay, so we have mentioned credit. Now let's go over to private equity and the differences on this one. So we've talked about some debt side of things. Now we're going to go directly into the investment in capital. Who wants to lead us off for this one? So Sinead, Sinead, say, Sinead is nodding the most, so you get her. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what I'd say with private equity is it is a very broad church. So you have everything from the high risk, high return end of the market, which is investing in startups, venture capital, all the way up to things like um, carve outs, whereby a certain part of a business is taken private to uh, leverage buyout of an entire business all the way up to, you know, massive types of transactions, you know, that uh, you might think of that the likes of Warren Buffett would be looking to do, right? So so these are um, the huge range of different um, size of assets and kind of levels of risk that you've got in private equity. So I would say that as an asset class, you know, I guess that's the first consideration is what is your risk appetite? What is the time horizon that you have? Because private equity um, very much is a long-term investment, I would say seven to 10 years. And you know whether it is a closed-end fund, which is typically a 10-year time horizon, um, or something that's more evergreen, investors should be entering into something like that um, with that long-term mindset. Yep. There's not- uh, I'll add uh, private equity, like its name means it is it like a liquid um liquid sorry listed equities its returns are really driven by the same things as listed equities they're the um the macro environment as well as the way other businesses will develop produce their earnings uh one difference is the liquidity aspect where it forces a discipline but one important thing to to understand about um the benefits of having private equity at at times or as a strategic allocation, if that's how you choose to do it, is um, li- listed markets for the last 10 years or maybe longer have become more and more concentrated. Part of that is um, the winners at the top of the market have just continued getting bigger. Mm. But another part of that is a lot of what we would have seen in the past um, is private companies going public. They've extended that that period being private Um so you don't actually have access to a lot of areas of the economy through listed equities that you would have traditionally at I, some point. I will I will echo that quite loudly and to say that we've started I've started companies and taken them take and sold them before they've hit the market. I've also we, we've also started companies and taken them to market. I'll tell you which one I prefer. Going out, going out and having everything, all of your underwear and everything exposed up on the line every single day on the stock market cannot be advantageous all the time diplomatically way of saying that that it's much better sometimes to go look we're just going to focus on our business and getting this done and maybe finding a liquidity event for people as opposed to having everyone constantly worrying about the share price every day yeah correct. and that is absolutely um one of the most appealing reasons for businesses to stay private like you know some of the statistics are really interesting in terms of um you know 20 years ago versus today 
um, there are half the number of listed companies out there. Um, and to your point, Jimmy, like it's just less appealing for mm. businesses in many cases. Like if they need to raise capital, if they need to raise debt, they can do that while they stay a private business. Yeah. And, you know, I guess the other interesting statistics that stick in my head is that 90% of US companies are private. Yeah. And 80% of US employees work for a private business. Yep. And so therefore, by not investing in private equity, you are missing out on a huge part of the market. Now, maybe your risk appetite means that that is not the place that you want to play. But I would say that it is a massive market and more and more companies are choosing to stay private. Yeah. I, I would add uh, the private equity space does have quite a bit of variety across it. So you mentioned um, leveraged buyouts. That's probably what you hear a lot about on the news where um, a large company is taken private. That has a different sort of risk and return expectation to, say, a smaller company that's um, growing or a fast in a fast-growing or new industry. So it's also having a think about what you'd want to be exposed to because um, the larger the business, they'll often have um, a lot more leverage there trying to get their their earnings maximized by doing a lot of cost cutting so th there's there's different levels of risk and whether or not you're getting the best return out of your investment um, from from different types of private equity investment not uh, at all okay so we've talked about we've defined what it is we've given some examples specifically underneath and what investors should be looking out for and advisors too Anything else that, um, that that if you really want to get in under the hood and do a little bit more DD on some of the potential private equity investments that you can make? Any other ways of going about that? Not in terms of DD, but um, if you are really worried about the liquidity or lack of liquidity, there is, um, as as Sinead mentioned, um, democratization. There is um, listed private equity indices and ETFs on the way. Uh, on the way. Yeah. On the Do, way. But, what, what can you offer? So are we talking liquid alts here? Is this what we're sort of saying? No, no. Because no, no. no, liquid alts is sort of a, no, a term that's really big. That's a different, that's, yeah. yeah. No, it's, it's, again, if you think about factor investing, you could argue that with private equity, a lot of what you're getting is a small cap premium. Yep. And you're earning an illiquidity premium over the top of that, ideally. But you're also paying a fee for that. And now... Um, Obviously, this is still a very new part of um, part of the investment universe. It's probably extremely niche and, and um, has a long way to go. But there's a few different approaches uh, to basically having a mutual fund that tries to deliver your after fee return similar to private equity by investing in small caps without having to worry about the liquidity premium. Okay. Well, that's that's potentially something to go right into. So if you are investing, if we've talked about this, so as an investor, you've got to be looking at a longer time frame. You have to be looking at potentially mm -hmm. that you're going to be locked up a little bit and also just adjust your expectations that, that you're going to be having on I'd those. I also say that you have to consider where we are in the macro environment. So, you know, going back to my point about, you know, higher interest rate environment, it has been a tough environment for private equity over the last couple of years. Yep. Um, you know, financing costs are higher. Um, you know, when you consider how companies are valued using a discounted cash flow model, you're applying a higher interest rate. Um, so it's unsurprising that private equity has had a tough time. Whereas you look at previous vintages, pre-pandemic, for example, and private equity um, delivered really strong returns. So what I would say is that I mean, you need to manage vintage risk when you're investing in private equity. So what I mean by that is if I'm to invest in a 10-year closed-end fund and I'm investing today and that private equity manager is going to look to deploy capital over the next, let's say, two to three years, I'm beholden to the current macro environment when that team is investing, whereas maybe a couple of years ago, it might have been a more compelling environment for private equity. And so therefore, it makes sense as a private equity investor to think about investing maybe smaller amounts in multiple vintages across different timeframes. And therefore, you're not subject to the prevailing market conditions 
um, because obviously none of us can predict the future. No, but I mean, if you were going to say the rates were going to come down over the next couple of years, I think, which is widely expected that that's, that that's generally, unless there's more cataclysms or whatever it is that we've got going on, that's generally expected to be the case. Would you say that was a good environment to, to, to be going into in a declining rate environment? Look, what I would say is I think, yes, the consensus view is that interest rates are going to go lower, but also the consensus view is that interest rates are going to uh, stay higher for longer. So yes, we might see, you know, circa one, one and a half percent reduction in interest rates in developed markets. But the reality is, is that we're not going back to the sort of levels that we saw three, four years ago. And so therefore, this new normal that we're in, or as Vesta said earlier, we're really kind of going back to a more normalized interest rate environment. Yep. What investment teams can take into account is looking at um, the reward for risk that they're getting within that interest rate environment. Doesn't mean there aren't compelling investment opportunities across private equity, across private credit. What is really important and why it is so much easier now is because we have a clearer view on what the path forward is. Markets hate uncertainty. That's I think and that's, so, the that's the key. That's the key on it. At least you know where we are going to be. We know that it's not going to be another few percent higher. It may not be another few percent lower, but at least you know sort of where you can set your base, which means that you can give expectations and valuations and also, you know, just be able to remove that it's that sort of uncertainty. I'm doing your job, sorry. You guys, you guys, you just said that. That was that. fantastic. No, no, I, just, I literally just said what you said back to you. It's okay. It's the secret of my success. Um, okay. Now I'm just going to fire through a few of these, mm -hmm. a few of these questions that we've got on here. How can investors gain access to alternative investments? So look, previously only available to institutional investors. Now there's new product structures in place, which means that A, the minimum amount has come down. Maybe there's a bit more liquidity in place. There's more evergreen type structures. They still don't offer daily liquidity. Maybe they offer monthly or quarterly liquidity. Uh, you know, it definitely opens up new avenues for investors. And so therefore, there are elements of, of liquidity that weren't available before, but I would caution investors that these are long-term investments and, and to have that mindset when you enter into them. I think the um, remembering it is a long-term investment, any of the private market investments, not just because they're somewhat illiquid, but you actually do need to hold them for a certain amount of time to truly accrue the return from, from that asset. Otherwise, you're almost cutting yourself short. So that, yeah, that's totally like, true, isn't it? Like it when is. you buy private equity, you're dependent on that private equity manager actually growing the business, you know, adding operational efficiencies, um, you know, turning that business around, and you've got to give them enough time to do that. Yep. Correct. And so that illiquidity to an ex to a degree is actually a good self imposed discipline, or not not self imposed, but. If you choose to um, invest, then yes, it's 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 got to be there. It's often very difficult when you have a changing scenario um, to be able to to be able to be disciplined like that, especially when it comes to. Anyway, I won't go into that. <laughs> sort of That's my so one of my one of my hardest things to do with an advisor over the years is have a, a client say, "This is it. It's done. You can't add. You can't touch it, but you can touch it. If something and then something always comes up that you have to be able to do. It's just like that was meant to not be liquid." You can't suddenly want to liquidate it. So there's well, risk. Well, that's where I think private credit funds are quite interesting because while they're illiquid, they're very short duration. So you, you probably have um, roughly a three-year average loan yep. life, three to five. But if you have something similar to private equity where you have a nice um, range of vintages, so to speak, where because the loans are um, a, a very short duration or short term, if you have enough loans, you're you're constantly able to recycle, but you can also pay out reasonable redemptions. On top of that, with spreads of about five, six, seven percent over cash, mm. you're getting a really nice regular yield. Yeah. So Which ten percent back means you're you're actually getting quite a nice income and and a return of capital. Yeah, very good, very good. Uh, now we've already sort of handled some of these. What to expect from alternative investments when something happens in macro environment? We've covered that. Um, in the up and down, up and down areas. What role do alternatives play in a portfolio? Growth or defensive? Sort of both, depending on which one you want to take. But yeah, specifically, mm -hmm. um, I think private markets are less of the defensive, less of the uncorrelated, for the primary reason being they're still driven by the same primary um, macro um, factors that the rest of the listed markets are. But that said, you, you are diversifying your your sources of return. You're getting access to 
different um, uh, market cap of business, and that's that's the same in um, in private credit, Australian private credit. You're not concentrated in financials and resources, so you're getting more middle market, large large businesses, but they're not the same um, sectors as as the listed or, or ASX 300. Spot on, spot on. Uh, one here is just interesting. What amount of a portfolio should be invested in alternatives? It's difficult to answer. Yeah, it really depends on it's investors. A lot of risk tolerance, oh, investment five, time frame. Five, five, six percent. Yeah, yeah just go. Yeah, you know, um, I'm kidding. Do not. Sorry. You're, you're, I'm, I'm not going <laughs> to sign a number, but look, yeah. um, what I would say is that your typical high net worth investor might have something in the low single digits. Yeah. And um, what's interesting is that often advisors are advocating a higher amount than that, and that is often driven by a either a view on on the compelling investment opportunity or or those additional uh, roles that it can play in in portfolios. And I guess that one of the key reasons why you know that the actual versus the advocated for amount can can differ is because. The level of comfort with alternatives just isn't quite there yet. Mm-hmm. And um, so it's really great that we're having these sorts of conversations so that um, you know, people can build their confidence and really understand and um, what it is that you're getting. Because, you know, whether when you're investing in public or private, you are buying a share in a business if you're buying equity, or you are lending money to a business if you are investing in credit. If you're investing in infrastructure, you're buying things like, you know toll roads and and um, uh, poles and wires and like so a lot of these things are really tangible and easily understood you know once we kind of get under the hood a bit more yeah I, I did see something I was trying to pull up the stats about um, family offices and the allocations that family offices are holding now the the amount that was in private was actually quite significant that it, so much so and I think cynically thinking about it, it it might just be because the people who the alloc- the people who allocate for family offices, do prefer it to be in that because it's got a it's got a more defensive when I say defensive I mean defensive from a portfolio reporting point of view it doesn't move in that volatile way that a daily sort of a, a, a daily equity holding or even mm-hmm. um, a, a bond holding would actually still moves on a, on, a, on a minute by minute basis that does give some sort of I'm trying to think about what the some comfort to people to be able to say look it's pretty much about the same as where it was when you invested in the beginning of the year. It's probably going to be about the same as it is. We're there. You're going to get this nice, healthy return that's on there, as opposed to something happens in Japan with an interest rate, and there's some sort of an unwind of a carry trade. Next thing you know, everything is gone bananas on the one day that I needed to send the portfolio to you, and now uh, my phone is ringing from every single family office that I've got in my entire book. I, I have cynical. So many <laughs> things I could say to that. But that last one is probably the most exciting as a portfolio manager because when, when, um, oh. When markets are down, you want to buy. Yeah. You want to buy. You want to rebalance. And um, as long as nothing has materially changed. So having – and this is where portfolio construction comes into it. Having illiquid assets in there is really great because it reduces the overall portfolio volatility, but it also does limit your ability to rebalance. And that's where having other diversifiers in there that are more liquid help because you can actually improve your total portfolio return. Very good. Um, But I think the familiarity aspect is one where it's natural and it, it always progresses. So private markets are probably the most familiar. They're a repackaging of for most, for the most part, a repackaging of what people are already f- already know. Um, there is agency risk in there to an extent because of the opacity, but that's that's extended across all assets. Well, uh, I think I'm, I'm I'm about ready to wrap it up now. So, <laughs> last words from either of you, if you'd like to. Last words for me is that you know we do have this focus on liquidity and being able to see on a screen what our portfolios are worth, and that is kind of behaviorally understandable. But the reality is is that we need to consider how much of our portfolios we would be happy to have in a liquid asset. Because when you consider public markets are liquid until they're not. And when markets um, suffer severe drawdowns, liquidity disappears. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, there's liquidity on the way up. There's not always liquidity on the way down. And so, therefore, when you take that mindset, maybe liquidity is more about an investor's time horizon 
and less about avoiding what is a huge part of the market. Yeah. I'm going to really badly paraphrase that famous investor Buffett. <laughs> Just, Jimmy he Buffett. basically summarized Warren Buffett, Warren Buffett <laughs> not Jimmy Buffett. Um, <laughs> in the short term, the market's a betting machine. In the long term, it's a weighing Wayne machine. machine. And if, if um, you think about the, the volatility in, in, in listed markets as noise for a lot of the time, so earlier in August, it was definitely a lot of noise. Then having having a a filter on on that through an investment that's less liquid is actually beneficial for a lot of people. Perfect. That's a great way of putting it. And I, I believe the greatest investment book ever written is is called Shut Up and Wait, and it is just the S and P five hundred every page over a hundred years sort of anyway that's that that's sort of the area that's there but the idea the idea and the same thing goes for private the same thing goes for credit it's just like mm-hmm. pick it stick it choose your manager well make sure that you, you you know what's underneath as much as you can do make sure it's rated yeah i think that we've learned a lot here thank you for joining us uh i've been joined so i've been joined <laughs> um i'm off to margaritaville myself here jimmy speaking of jimmy buffett uh could not <laughs> couldn't have done it without you vesna Poroska. Portfolio Manager at Morningstar and Sinead Ravity, Senior Investment Specialist at Fedante Partners. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, Jim. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much. I have been, I have, and still am, James Whelan uh, of Barclay Pierce Capital's Wealth Management Team. And this has been another Ensemble Investment Podcast brought to you by Morningstar. Have yourself a great day and stay safe. Mm-hmm.